Uh, now I am delighted to welcome our speaker this evening. Julia, Julia Kaviki is the education director at Rich Earth Institute. Uh, the Rich Earth Institute engages in research, education, and technolo technological innovation to advance the use of human waste as a resource. Thank you so much for joining us, Julia. Hey, thanks so much for having me. Really lovely to connect with you all tonight. Um, I'll get started with sharing my slides here. Um, and yeah, look forward to hearing your, your questions and talking about them at the end um, of my presentation. Um, so let's see here, there we go. Um, so I'm gonna kind of just orient us to the big picture of our nutrient landscape and what currently happens with our, our nutrient flows. And then we'll zoom in to look at some projects around the world and what Richard's project here in Brattleboro looks like on the community scale and what some of our um, thinking is around growing the community scale of human waste reclamation. And then I'll dive into some tips and, and tricks for using urine as a fertilizer in your own garden. So lots of, lots of different scales of things to mull over this evening. So um, as Heather said, our, um, that our vision is around uh, integrating work in education, technology, and research. And we do that to work towards our vision of a world with abundant clean water and fertile soil achieved by reclaiming the nutrients from our bodies in a life-sustaining cycle. Um, so when we take, this, take a step back and look at the big picture of our, our nutrient landscape, we often talk about the sanitation system as a flush and forget system where we flush our toilets and don't often think about where that waste is going. But of course, you're here tonight and so you know on some level that waste is going somewhere and it's having consequences. And with both our sewer and septic systems, those were designed primarily to remove organic matter and pathogens. And when functioning properly, they can do that pretty well, but they often still release a vast majority of the nutrients in our waste, along with other contaminant compounds that get combined together in this single stream system, like pharmaceuticals and hormones, and also microplastics and other emerging contaminants like PFAS. So this all gets combined together and sent downstream where the nutrients in particular accumulate and fertilize harmful algal blooms. And this is really a growing problem around the world as warmer waters are making more beneficial conditions for these blooms to occur. Um, and uh, also um, have more heavy precipitation events and flooding from climate change are causing more nutrients to accumulate in our water bodies. And uh, so when our nitrogen and phosphorus are in our water bodies, they fertilize these blooms, which can then produce neurotoxins that accumulate in shellfish and deoxygenate the water, resulting in these mass fish kill events, and also just generally make the water unfit for drinking and recreating in. So not a great end fate for what's happening with our nutrients in this conventional system. So we think of this as all part of the linear nutrient flow, where on the one hand, we're using extractive and sometimes exploitative processes to procure the nutrients for use in agriculture. And on the other hand, we're flushing them away and wasting them and uh, having them cause pollution and problems in our aquatic ecosystems. Um, so just to quickly spotlight some of the social and environmental ramifications of this uh, linear nutrient train. On the fertilizer procurement side of things for nitrogen fertilizer or synthetic nitrogen fertilizer specifically, it's a very energy intensive process to produce through the Haber-Bosch process, which takes the nitrogen out of the air essentially and turns it into a plant avail available form. And this contributes about one to 2% of global greenhouse gas emissions just for nitrogen fertilizer alone. And in recent years, we've been seeing the prices of these fertilizers really spiking as energy prices are rising. It's also then causing the fertilizer prices to rise. And um, when the war in Ukraine was starting, there were a lot of headlines about farmers being really desperate for alternatives for nitrogen fertilizer that can be more sustainable and more locally procured and more affordable. And then for phosphorus fertilizer, this is largely available in limited rock reserves um, in specific geographic locations around the world. In the US, we have some reserves in Florida and a couple other locations. Um, but a lot of phosphorus is mined from Morocco specifically, where they have huge phosphorus mines that have had, um, you know, a lot of human rights abuses in terms of displaced peoples and also um, kind of labor injustices and in how the phosphorus is mined. And um, also just um, really, truly bizarre um, processes like they, the world's largest conveyor belt 
um, brings the phosphorus from the phosphorus mines to the ports for transportation. You can actually see the phosphorus conveyor belt from space. Um, so truly wild and also um, increasingly limited because um, we're using more and more phosphorus and only have this limited amount um, available in the ground. So then we use all of those nutrients to grow our food in agriculture and eat the food and our bodies excrete the excess nutrients that they don't need to grow. And then oftentimes we excrete those nutrients into flush toilets, which um, kind of have another step of waste along the way where we put our small amount of human waste in this large amount of clean potable water to continue it on its journey. We've estimated that the US wastes about 900 billion gallons of clean water every year just to flush our toilets alone. So we could have a really big impact if we just rethought our, our sanitation system a little bit and conserve that water for other vital uses, especially in areas in the US that experience a lot more drought with climate change. And then we send all of those nutrients onward to our wastewater systems, which we saw earlier largely don't remove the nutrients and send them into our waterways um, when functioning properly. But increasingly, also, our wastewater systems are uh, vulnerable to climate change and underfunded and um, failing in a lot of places across the country. And the US, um, it's an engineering society of America. I forget the, their exact name. But every year, they come out with a report card for um, America's infrastructure and for our wastewater infrastructure. And their most recent report card, they gave it a D plus because of how um, kind of ill-equipped it is to um, serve the current people it's trying to serve and also um, deal with the, the future stresses of climate change. So for sewer systems, a common problem is this issue of combined sewer overflows, where both stormwater and wastewaters are combined into pipes that have to go to the treatment plant to be treated. And so when we have heavy precipitation events, they overflow straight into our rivers where they they send untreated human waste into our rivers. And for septic systems, um, there's a similar issue where um, when there's a lot of flooding, septic fields can be inundated and also flood into our groundwaters, which then make their way to our other bodies of water. And in Vermont, we saw this a lot with the recent flooding, both this year and last year, of having really devastating effects on both kinds of wastewater treatment systems. So this is the kind of conventional nutrient line. And what we're working to do at Rich Earth and many other places around the world are working to do is to reconnect the dots of this line into what we call the food nutrient cycle. And um, while a lot of the technologies and some of the processes I'm gonna talk about today are new, this basic concept is a really kind of ancient one that's almost as prevalent, um, you know, as humans have been practicing the um, recycling of our waste into agriculture since the dawn of agriculture. And there's a really great book that details some examples of this called Farmers of 40 Centuries. Um, that includes some really early examples from Asia. Um, so we've calculated at Rich Earth that every day the average human body produces enough fertilizer in the form of urine to grow the wheat required to bake one loaf of bread. And I think this is just a nice way of visualizing the potential for reciprocity between ourselves and the land where we can give the land in abundance all of these nutrients and it can in turn give us a wonderful amount of food to feed ourselves. Um, so why are we focusing on urine recycling specifically? Well, uh, in this graph, you can see that um, in terms of the total volume that makes up wastewater, um, a huge amount of it is just clean potable water that we're then contaminating with this relatively small amount of human waste. So um, this is another way to visualize it in this graph here in terms of volume. But then if we look at the nitrogen and phosphorus content, the nutrient content of our waste, urine actually contains a vast majority of those nutrients. So by doing a relatively small act volume-wise of diverting our urine at the source, we can have a relatively big impact on preventing that downstream nutrient pollution and on procuring those nutrients and recycling them for use in, in agriculture in our local food systems. But you'll see, and, and so that's also why we're focused on urine recycling as sort of the low-hanging fruit and uh, the poo composting has great benefits, especially in terms of um, organic matter, but is um, a lot more logistically challenging and also regulatorily, reg, reg, regulatorily challenging. I'm not sure if that's quite the word, um, but I can get more into that later. Um, but on this third, this fourth graph, you'll see that urine contains about half of the micropollutants. And what this is, is the pharmaceuticals in urine. Um, and we know this is a big question that a lot of people have before they feel comfortable thinking about using urine as a fertilizer. 
So Rich Earth actually did a six year research project with the University of Michigan on this question. And I think it's useful to start by framing, you know, what currently happens to the pharmaceuticals in our urine in that linear paradigm where it's both a linear nutrient paradigm and also a linear pharmaceutical flow paradigm where when we flush our toilets, all of the drug compounds in our waste end up accumulating in our aquatic ecosystems where they have all kinds of bizarre effects on the life that lives there. Um, and if you're interested in learning more about this, there are a whole field of research studies about the effects on fish behavior and physiology and effects that ramify up the food chain. So if we think about reclaiming our urine as a fertilizer, we can protect those aquatic ecosystems that don't really have a way to degrade the pharmaceutical compounds. But of course, it raises new questions about um, the impact of these compounds on the soil and crop tissue that we might be eating. So in our six year study with the University of Michigan, the University of Buffalo and the Hampton Roads Sanitation District, Rich Earth looked at the fate of pharmaceutical compounds in urine with um, levels that were very high so that um, we could even detect it in the crop tissue because, um, and uh, we looked at a wide range of compounds as well to see the effects of um, different kinds of pharmaceuticals. And essentially what they found is that they only accumulate in crop tissue at very, very small levels or insignificant as a human health exposure pathway levels. You'd have to eat a pound of urine fertilized lettuce every day for a thousand years to get back the same amount of caffeine that's in one cup of coffee. So really tiny levels. Um, but And we have reason to believe that it might be soil microbes who are helping to break down these pharmaceutical compounds. Um, and uh, so we have a new study that we're working on um, to look at the potential soil health effects of long-term urine fertilization, because that's kind of a new question that came out of this study. So um, we have a five-year soil health research project that we're now doing with Cornell University and U Michigan to um, continue to explore this question. Um, so a few spotlights of other projects around the world before I get into Rich Earth's work here in Brattleboro. Uh, one of the largest urine uh, recycling projects we know of is in South Central Niger, where a farmer's union educated about 3,000 primarily female farmers to start reclaiming their urine as a fertilizer to grow more food to feed their families. Um, and one of the interesting things about this project is the um, project leaders worked with local village um, religious leaders and other village leaders to think about how they could make it a more socially acceptable practice. And the idea they came up with was to rename the urine when it's from when it's urine the waste to urine the fertilizer so that there's a cognitive shift that happens um, when you're gonna start using it in your garden. So they decided to name it Oga, which in the indigenous Igbo language means the boss. So when you're fertilizing with urine, you're working with the boss in your garden. <laughs> Um, and there's a whole paper about um, this project you can read if you're interested in learning more about it. Um, and then over in Switzerland, uh, the Swiss Institute of Aquatic Science and Technology has really been the grandmother institution of urine uh, research, um, urine recycling research. And they've been looking into this since the early 90s in terms of uh, both practical implementation and also um, implications uh, for environmental and social impacts. Um, and economic impacts. And as a result of their work, they've now created this whole spin-off company, Vuna Nexus, that's installing building scale urine treatment technology throughout Europe. And their technology produces this concentrated urine fertilizer product that they now sell in gardening stores at enough of a profit to form part of the business case of their company. So that's been really cool to see. Um, if you ever find yourself in Brattleboro, we have some, some vials of this <laughs> RN fertilizer at our research center. Um, and uh, most recently in Paris, where you might have been hearing some headlines from the Olympics about the ickiness of the water quality there, um, they've been putting a lot of effort into cleaning up the water, especially um, with this, uh, they call it the scissor effect in Paris, where there's a rising population level and a lowering water level in the river Seine. So there's more and more nutrients being diluted in less and less water. Um, so because of that, the Paris Water Agency really recognizes the value of urine diversion in protecting their water, water quality to the point where they will now subsidize up to 80% of any new development project that incorporates urine recycling. Um, which has enabled a lot of new, really large-scale urine recycling projects to start coming online, including this entire neighborhood that's being built with urine collection um, into it. 
So over in the US, um, Rich Earth uh, is the only ones, we're the only ones doing pea cycling on the community scale, but we have a lot of other partners that we're working with to advance different aspects of um, completing that food nutrient cycle, including policy and toilet design um, and public outreach. Um, and up in Burlington, Wasted is a new portable toilet company that came to Vermont from California because Rich Earth pioneered these um, regulation, this regulatory pathway for urine recycling. And they um, were able to come to Burlington and start this portable toilet company that recycles urine um, and, uh, and collects it from, from many different events. Um, also in Vermont is Point of Shift, which is a compost toilet consulting um, organization led by Kelsey McWilliams. Um, and down in Brattleboro, Vermont is the Rich Earth Institute. We've been around since 2012. Um, started by really um, a bunch of um, people who were collecting urine for their gardens already and finding that they were collecting way more than they could use in their gardens. And a local farmer who was really interested in completing the food nutrient cycle on his farm and finding a way of procuring more urine to, to fertilize his farm. And our two co-founders, Abe and Kim, who really put the dots together and got the um, community and technical um, infrastructure in place to build this community scale urine recycling program and have grown from there to do a lot of research projects with other partners across the country. So the heart of what we do is this community scale program, which enables us to demonstrate that it is possible to pea cycle. It's not just a theory, but it can be done in practice um, and also enables us to research a lot of questions we have around how this might scale and how it might look in different contexts. Um, so we now collect about 12,000 gallons of urine every year, which since our founding has enabled us to conserve about 2.3 million gallons of clean water that would have otherwise been wasted to flush that urine away. Um, and really the backbone of our community program is our urine donors who contribute their nutrients voluntarily to our program to be recycled for local farms. And they do this for three really core reasons. One is to conserve all of that water that they would have otherwise had to flush away. The other is to um, stop polluting their local river, in our case, the Connecticut River, going down to the Long Island Sound. And also to be able to support local farms in a really unique way of providing their nutrients back to the farms. It's sort of like a PSA corollary to the CSA model. <laughs> um, and every year we have an annual piss off competition to encourage a little friendly competition between our, our yarn donors and the winners get this um, Judy Zemmel trophy, which um, rotates between households. Um, so there's four main steps in how our community program works. And I'll just quickly walk through what each of those looks like next. Um, for collection, there's a variety of ways you can collect urine. The sort of easiest entry option is this portable urine collector that Rich Earth has designed over the years, which is basically a two and a half or five gallon jug with some concatenated plumbing parts connected to a funnel, which makes a very watertight um, collection setup and also um, largely odor free. If you add about um, one to two cups of white vinegar to your container before you start collecting, and then we also provide this ball that sits in the center of the funnel and acts as a valve check. And those two things together um, make it a pretty odor-free experience. And then um, in recent years, we've also partnered with Toilets for People, which is a local compost toilet company based in Jamaica, Vermont, to design this um, pea toilet, which is uh, basically the portable um, urine collector, but with a sit, a seated um, seat on it. <laughs> uh, so you can sit to pee if you prefer to do that. Um, there's also a variety of accoutrements that you can have to go with your collector, including this nun's cap, which fits under your toilet seat. So you can sit to pee in that and then pour it in your funnel um, or various stand to pee urination devices like the pee style. So for folks who are collecting that way, they'll have these in their bathrooms. And once it's full, you can unscrew the funnel and screw on a cap and bring it to one of our two urine depots. We have one in Brattleboro and one up in Bellows Falls. And they have a little self-serve pumping station where you can um, pull the nozzle down and pump out your nutrients and bring home your empty container and keep collecting. Um, this is also where we have our piss off contest logbook. <laughs> um, and uh, so then for folks who wanna streamline urine collection into their homes and not have kind of an added chore of bringing your urine recycling around, um, we have a variety of urine diverting toilets that we've been installing in local homes and businesses. Um, so there's a, there are urine diverting composting toilet options like this Vosman Eco Dry. 
um, where the urine collects in a tank in your basement and the solids can collect in a composter. Or there are a variety of urine diverting flush toilets where the front half can collect in a tank and the back half can be flushed to your sewer or septic system. Um, and most recently, we've been excited about this Laughlin Save toilet model, which was designed in part with funding from the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation in Europe, um, because it uses uh, what they call the teapot effect, where um, it uses the physics of how urine flows slightly slower to catch it in this urine trap and then save that. And then um, the faster moving flush water can bloom into the back half of the toilet. And this model is really exciting because it eliminates a lot of the potential for user error that can happen with other kinds of urine diverting toilets. So really excited to advocate for more of these toilets in the US to install them in more public places. And that's what they've been doing in Europe where um, a lot of the toilets that, that Vuna company uses are the Lofen Save. They've installed these in places like the European Space Agency and all kinds of other locations. And then there are a variety of urine only fixtures you can install um, if you want to just add it into a second bathroom, for example, and not have to replace your entire toilet, but can add, a, add another option as a way to collect easily. So um, when the urine is collected in people's homes or businesses or at our urine depots, we then go around and pump it out. Um, it's kind of like the inverse of getting your oil delivered. You can get your nutrients lifted away. Um, and we so uh, here's our hose connected to a local urine donor's home. Um, and basically, it's just a, a truck like any other truck, but it has a vacuum pump retrofitted onto it. So we can easily pump liquids onto and off of the truck. Um, we store uh, large IBC totes in the bed so we can easily move liquids around. And then when we bring all of the urine back to our research center for processing, we sanitize it. And I'll have an, a further note on sanitization in a second, but um, for our community scale program, we treat it all according to the US EPA method for biosolid treatment, um, which is the closest category the regulators could find to put us in um, while recognizing that urine is different from biosolids that come out of a treatment plant. Um, and so we have this custom created pasteurizer that our spin off company, Bright Water Tools, designed um, that just uses a um, heat transfer system to heat, um, well, it heats urine uh, to about 80 degrees Celsius for a minute and a half. And it has a heat transfer system in it so that um, as the hot urine is leaving the system, it can transfer its heat to the cold urine that's entering and in total be as energy efficient as possible. It uses about the same amount of energy as one light bulb to run, which is pretty awesome. So once we've treated all of our urine, we apply it on local farms. Um, we primarily do hay farm uh, urine application, but in recent years have also been partnering with a wide variety of other farms. Um, through, we do a lot of USDA funded research grants to partner with different farms and explore ways to optimize urine fertilization and integrate it into their ongoing farming processes. So here's a few snapshots of different farmers we've worked with. We've fertilized cut flowers and hemp and sweet corn and figs, um, in addition to um, lots of different hay fields in the area. <laughs> Um, so one of our earliest research projects was looking at the impact of urine fertilization when compared to synthetic fertilizer on hay yield. And essentially we found that when you apply it at the same nitrogen loading rate, it has the same impact on increasing the yield. Um, and you can see that the diluted urine had a slightly higher impact on increasing the yield, which we think is because um, the dilution helps the urine integrate into the soil a bit better. Um, but I'll, I'll talk a little bit more about that when we get to the gardening slides as well. Um, so this is our sweet corn farmer that we partnered with retrofitting his tractor. So as he went through and cultivated the corn, it was also applying urine. And we partnered with him for the past two years to do um, research on that. Um, and then here at our research center, we have a vermiponic system, which is um, these hydroponic murals that combine both um, worm tea and human urine which it turns out kind of have the um, nutrient, um, a, a good match of nutrients for what a hydroponic system needs to operate. And so we grow a lot of lettuce in the system and eat it as staff and donate it also to the local food bank. And this system was designed by an organization based in California called the Dark Nectar Cooperative, who's really interested in increasing food growing options for folks without access to land. Um, and so they sent us the system to trial legally with urine in Vermont. Um, so based on our program, we're now working to support other communities in adopting urine recycling programs of our own, their own, or translating what we've learned into their contexts. 
We have a guide that summarizes everything entailed in starting a urine diversion program. And we're now working um, very closely with partners in Cape Cod to help them get um, some urine recycling off the ground as they have a lot of nutrient pollution problems, both in the coastal areas and in the ponds there. Um, and then over in Vermont, um, we've also been working with other partners to explore how we could expand urine recycling across the state here, especially as we've already piloted the sort of regulatory pathway for how this could work, expanding it um, across the state is a lot easier here than, than other states where those dots have to be put together. Um, it is kind of interesting to think about the, the nutrient landscape of Vermont in terms of um, Connecticut River and Lake Champlain, where we have different primary nutrient drivers. So a lot of our work here in Brattleboro is funded through um, our connection with the Long Island Sound, where we're mostly focused on preventing the nitrogen nutrient pollution. And then up in the other half of the state, phosphorus is more of the um, limiting nutrient in the freshwater ecosystems. Um, so the phosphorus is more of a focus on the other half of the state. And urine is rich in both, <laughs> though, though more of a nitrogen fertilizer. Um, and so as I was, we were talking about earlier with um, the heavy flooding we've been seeing in Vermont um, and the impacts that's been having both on septic systems and on our centralized wastewater treatment plants. Um, I think we're increasingly trying to think about um, what on-site, um, what kinds of on-site resource recovery systems might be less vulnerable to these stresses of climate change. We don't have the, the solution for that, that full kind of system, but we're um, really interested in working towards that to provide more options for places where water-based sanitation systems are increasingly um, under threat. Um, and another kind of note about the intersection of, of climate change and sanitation in Vermont is around this goal of um, compact village settlement or smart growth that a lot of towns have where you want to fit more people into the village center so there's less driving people have to do and less rural sprawl and less um, habitat fragmentation and all these other um, benefits of smart growth but one of the key stumbling blocks to really implementing this strategy in a lot of Vermont towns is the lack of space for new wastewater systems whether that means installing um, more septic systems for homes or, you know, a lot of towns can't afford a whole wastewater treatment plant um, to install. And so trying to think about what kinds of um, on-site uh, reuse systems might be able to help unlock this future is something that we're interested in as well. Um, so some of these dynamics are outlined in our village sanitation pilot study that we did in partnership with the Wyndham Regional Commission. Um, thank you to Chris Gaynor, a former Eco-AmeriCorps member who helped uh, create this, this study. And really what this study did was highlight a lot of um, kind of uh, regulatory and technical um, new questions that need to be figured out to um, unlock some of these solutions for Vermont communities. Um, so we've been um, working with some legislators and also collaborating with Vermont regulators to figure out what a new pathway could be for, for new kinds of systems. Um, and on that note, uh, we also have an entire spin-off company now called Brightwater Tools that's working on um, creating new technologies for on-site reuse at the building scale. Um, and essentially, they have this treatment train of a whole bunch of different technologies to create a concentrated and high-quality and sanitized urine fertilizer product um, that could go in, in the basements of large buildings. And they've been doing installations across the country and also in partnership with um, organizations in Europe as well. Um, so now onto the home gardening scale of urine fertilization. Um, we have all of this detailed in our uh, home garden guide called Urine My Garden. Um, and also uh, later this month, we're coming out with a farmer's guide to working with urine fertilizer that summarizes a lot of our on-farm partnerships from the past several years. Uh, so you can keep an eye out for that as well. But really the first thing to know about working with urine as a fertilizer is its nutrient content. So we've done nutrient analysis on urine, um, just like any other fertilizer, it has an NPK, um, which is 0 0.6, 0 0.1, 0 0.2. So it seems like small numbers because it's diluted with so much water, but it is um, you know, a good amount of nutrients and you'll quickly find that you produce a lot more urine than your, your garden can probably use in a year. Um, but in addition to that NPK, it also has a lot of micronutrients in, in it. So it's um, in some ways more of a complete fertilizer than what you could buy at the store um, because our bodies need all of these nutrients to live and then they excrete them and plants need all of those nutrients to live as well. Um, so uh, 
But one of the most important things to know about urine as a fertilizer is its propensity for losing the nitrogen into the air. And really, if you don't remember anything else about this section of the, of the presentation in terms of your, using urine in your own garden, this is really the most important thing to remember is that anytime urine is exposed to air, you're losing some of its uh, nitrogen value um, through this process of ammonia volatilization where it off gases as ammonia. So it's really important to keep urine enclosed from the air throughout your entire collection and fertilization process. We have some tips on how to do that. Um, and uh, as we talked about with the collection option, um, if you are preventing odors from forming through adding um, white vinegar to your container or using a um, valve check ball or generally keeping your container closed when you're not using it, um, that's also helping prevent the ammonia volatilization because when you smell that urine smell, you're smelling it lose its nitrogen value. Um, so yeah, as I mentioned, we have these urine collectors. They're available at our research center. If you are interested in stopping by, you can shoot us an email and come get one from us. We also sell them on Etsy now. Uh, we have an Etsy shop where you can pick, pick one up. Um, but there's also a lot of DIY collection methods people use. We have a community science survey, which um, gathers information about home, how home gardeners are using urine as a fertilizer around the world. And some of the common responses we've gotten from that have been wide mouth laundry detergent bottles and kitty litter containers, <laughs> which both can work just fine. Um, there's also the, um, the toilets for people pee toilet um, and other, uh, options that I've heard recently that are intriguing are um, if you have, if you garden with biochar, and I'll have a slide on this later, but um, filling a small bucket with biochar and then peeing into that until the biochar is soaked with your urine can be a really great way to have an odor free collection method and then some urine enriched biochar to use in your garden. Um, so for sanitization in home gardens, the World Health Organization has actually published guidelines on how to safely use urine to grow food. And essentially urine from healthy individuals is pathogen free. So it's totally safe to use in your garden without needing to sanitize it if you're just growing food to feed your own family because you won't um, you know, get yourself sick from a disease that you don't have. <laughs> um, but if you are gonna fertilize a public context um, or a farm, or if you're collecting urine from a wider swath of people than are gonna be eating the produce, or if you're using a urine diverting toilet where there's some potential for fecal contamination, it is important to sanitize the urine. Um, and the easiest way to do that at home is to just store it. And by storing it at room temperature for roughly six months, the pH in the urine will raise high enough that it will naturally kill all of the pathogens in the urine and be totally safe to use. Um, and then you can go out into your garden. Um, so there's three main principles for using any fertilizer, and they apply to urine as well, namely right amount, right place, and right time. So for thinking about right amount with urine, um, you can know the nutrient content that's in urine already um, with this NPK analysis we have. And then you can match make that with the nutrient needs of your soil. Um, so you can get a soil test done from the UVM State Extension Office. Um, if you so desire, and then also the nutrient needs of your plants. Um, and so because urine is so high in nitrogen, especially, we recommend um, primarily applying urine to heavy feeders um, or plants that need a lot of nitrogen fertilizer. So that would be your um, leafy greens um, or brassicas or corn or tomatoes. Um, and the Cornell Cooperative Extension has a really great um, overview of the nitrogen needs of a wide variety of different um, common garden vegetables. And that's linked in our home garden guide. Um, so if you're interested in learning more about um, vegetable nitrogen needs, that's a great resource to check out. Um, but if you don't wanna do all of the calculating and math of figuring out exactly how much urine should go where in your garden for which plant, another approach is just using the observation method of watching your plants for signs of nitrogen deficiency, like um, or yellowy pale undergrowth or um, slower growth than you would expect during that time of year um, and just apply accordingly. Um, or we've calculated this very rough rule of thumb that for a 10 foot by 10 foot garden or 100 square foot garden, uh, it's recommended to apply somewhere around three and a half to five and a half gallons of urine over the entire growing cycle. So divide that by, by however many applications you're doing. Um, and for our hay farm partners, that um, scales up to about a thousand gallons of urine per acre of hay. Um, and uh, so, yeah, I guess I already spoke on this, but um, good to fertilize heavy nitrogen feeders. You can also fertilize 
fruit or nut trees with urine, um, just kind of estimating where the roots are going based on the canopy overhead. Um, or you can fertilize your house plants if you uh, want to experiment a little closer to home. <laughs> um, we've also heard from folks um, different strategies for fertilizing grass or lawns. Um, this are, these are some photos from our former board member, David Cedarholm, who um, created this uh, little home garden scale cart to fertilize his lawn. Um, and he's shared that since then he's converted his lawn to um, more native plants that don't need as much fertilizer. But if you are growing a lawn like this, um, this can be a good use of your fertilizer. Um, and so then in terms of timing for urine fertilization, we recommend um, basically applying it when plants have their greatest nitrogen uptake uh, curve. So that's generally in the stage of growth when a plant is older than a young seedling, but before they're fruiting or flowering, because that nitrogen will stimulate more kind of leafy, shooty growth. And if you fertilize a plant that's trying to flower with the nitrogen, then it'll uh, divert its energy away from growing those fruits that you want. Um, and we generally recommend applying in several small applications rather than one big one. So you're feeding the plants as they need it in little snacks because urine is a very fast acting fertilizer. So it's important to um, just get it in, in the soil in um, multiple rounds rather than one big one. And then it's important to fertilize at least 30 days before you're gonna harvest any crops that you'll eat raw. And this is per those World Health Organization guidelines um, that are just to be extra precautious in case, um, you know, if there were something in the urine that you didn't want on fresh, um, like leafy greens, for example, um, it's just an extra 30 day buffer that's recommended. Um, and so then generally for application methods, um, per that ammonia volatilization uh, situation, it's important to incorporate the urine into moist soil in some way. Uh, so one way to do that is to dig a little hole or furrow next to your plant and um, pour the urine into that um, hole and then cover it with soil. Um, another way is to dilute your urine beforehand. Um, and so that's why in our hay yield trials, the diluted urine had a slightly higher um, increase um, on the hay yield was because uh, we think it was in integrated into the soil faster. So dilution is one way to do that or you can um, water your garden after you fertilize or fertilize just before the rain. And that's another way to help ensure the urine gets integrated into the soil as quickly as possible. And that's often what we do now with our farm partners rather than diluting as we just work with them to time our fertilization for um, when it's just about to rain so that it can be naturally integrated that way. Um, so yeah, dilution is not necessary, but it's something we hear commonly from home gardeners. It's also helpful if you're worried about over applying your urine and accidentally burning your plants. Dilution is a good way to um, help spread out that nutrient love between your plants a little bit more. Um, and the ratio level is really more of an art than a science, but generally somewhere around one to three or one to five parts urine to water is common. Um, though we have heard the broad range of one to one to one to 30, especially if you have a very dry garden, diluting a lot more can be helpful. Um, and in the nutrient breakdown of urine, you may have noticed it does have a fair amount of salt in it. Um, and so uh, whether or not salt accumulation in your garden is a problem really depends on um, how much precipitation your garden is receiving. So generally in our climate, um, we don't think salt precipitation or salt accumulation is a big issue because um, it just washes out through the soil. But if you're growing in a hoop house, it might be something to take note of. And if you do see signs of salt starting to accumulate, just flushing it with water is a good way to um, get it out of there. <laughs> um, and then a couple just uh, quick additional methods for fertilizing with urine in your garden. And then we'll, um, we can come back for Q&A. But um, one we've been interested in exploring recently is drip fertigation. We've done two research projects on that. It's a really great combination of if you have an irrigation system already set up, just adding a little urine into it can be a good way to get that urine into the um, right to the plant roots where they where it needs them. And it's a totally enclosed system, so it minimizes the air exposure and that ammonia volatilization as well. Um, you can also add urine to your compost pile, specifically if you have a very high carbon content compost heap, um, that will um, it'll absorb the nutrients in the urine and the urine will help break down the compost. If you have a high, a very green compost pile, we recommend not adding the urine because it's kind of like a already soaked sponge and doesn't have capacity to hang on to the nutrients in your urine. 
Um, and then urine and biochar, as I was saying earlier, we have a new, as part of our soil health study with Cornell, we're also looking at um, urine and biochar combinations, um, which is really a great match because the biochar can keep the nutrients in the urine soil available for longer um, and also um, uh, help sequester carbon into the soil. Um, and then we have this community science survey where folks share their own gardening experiences with urine fertilization, um, which is a, a great way for us to learn from what you're learning in your own garden. Because while there's a lot of research around the world on the agricultural scale of urine fertilization, there's not that much on doing it at the home garden scale. And so this is our way of helping share knowledge between gardeners who are doing this. Um, so we have a few additional add-on sheets to that survey, which are all on our website if you wanna learn more about them. Um, but I'll just hop us to the end so we have some time for Q&A. And if you're interested in um, more about the community science questions, I can um, bring those in later. Um, but we do offer um, installations of these toilets for folks in our um, Wyndham County area. If you have friends in our area who might be interested in a toilet like this, um, we're always seeking connections. Um, and then we have an annual summit coming up on November 12th through 14th. This year is going to be our 10th annual summit on urine reclamation, um, which is um, for the past two years, we've been doing it hybrid. So we have a hub in Brattleboro and an option to join virtually from around the world. Um, so if you're interested in learning more about this topic, definitely uh, recommend coming to that as well. Okay, and now I'll bring us back together for some Q&A. <laughs> Thank you so much, Julia. Um, that was so much great information. Um, so uh, just to remind everyone, we're going to be taking questions in the chat. And if you have not used Zoom chat before, down at the bottom of your Zoom screen, there's a button for chat. And if you click it, uh, your chat screen will pop up and you can enter your question there. Um, let's see. Um, so, Donald, I think you asked this question before we got to this slide, um, but let me know if you want any more information on that. Um, Kay has a question that I think we partially covered as well, um, uh, but part of this is, uh, would a properly built compost pile heat to a level that would be beneficial to sterilization? Hmm, that's a good question. Um, I know there there's been some different research on co-composting um, urine with other um, uh, yeah different different forms of compost um, and I I think a good resource maybe for learning more about this is um, and now that I'm saying it out loud I'm remembering they presented at our summit last year about um, their trials using urine with wood pellet um, in vessel composters that that was an effective method um, to um, achieve sanitization for the urine. Um, but our partner is up at the Adirondack Action Club. Um, they have an organization called Compost for Good. Um, John and Katie Culpepper have been doing a lot of research on um, urine composting with um, in, in, in vessel uh, composting systems. And they've been finding really great results on um, the urine accelerating the composting process and producing a very uh, nutrient rich compost at the end. Nice, thank you. Um, let's see, Geo asks, are there specific medications that one takes that would make pee not so good to use? Yeah, so in the pharmaceutical study that Rich Earth did with U Michigan, they included um, kind of the broadest suite of every kind of pharmaceutical you could be taking. Um, and so I think in terms of standard standard drugs or medicines, um, nothing um, nothing was out of the um, realm of what they studied in that project. Um, but there are a couple exceptions, like largely chemotherapy. Um, if you're undergoing chemotherapy, I think it's recommended to not use your urine as a fertilizer. But I think you might also get guidelines from your doctor about disposing of your waste separately than in your toilet anyway, for that case. Great, thank you. Um, let's see. Uh, so Donald asks, how should a home pea cycler manage pee in the winter? Yeah, so this is partly um, back when I was talking about, you know, the reason for Richard's founding of local gardeners having more pea than they could use. Um, part of the reasoning for having a larger community scale uh, pea cycling program is that 
Um, there's not a great solution for if you're just trying to use your urine in your own home garden for what to do with all that urine you'll collect over the winter. Um, but I think, um, you know, adding it to a compost pile or if you have like a lot of wood chips that you're trying to degrade, adding it to them could be an option. Um, but generally, I would say research how to start a community skill program in your own neighborhood and get in touch with us. <laughs> Um, but yeah, unfortunately, there's not uh, too great of a solution for that. Yeah. Got it. Um, so Geneva asks, how does using urine impact organic certification for farmers? Yeah, that's also a great question. And one we've been um, thinking about since, uh, since Richard's founding, organic certification uh, bans the use of biosolids on your land. Um, but they don't have a separate, and this is a common problem in the um, sort of legality of urine recycling writ large, but there's not a separate legal definition for urine, for, for urine from biosolids. And so it often falls in this gray area where it's um, up to the regulatory jurisdiction to decide how it should be regulated. Um, and so in the case of organic certification, um, Richard had talked with the Vermont Organic Certification Board about whether or not they would consider urine fertilizer to be organic. And they said it was really up to the national board and because it's in this great area, they didn't wanna make a decision. Um, and the national board hasn't, um, it's a kind of very long process to get something to be certified as organic with the national board. Um, so in lieu of that, um, we have this um, new project that we're working on of um, just creating a um, urine fertilizer certification itself um, as the first step towards um, the organic certification eventually of just starting with at least creating a new definition for urine based fertilizers from other kinds of biosolids fertilizers um, so that there can be that distinction. Um, but largely right now, Rich Earth partners with farms that follow organic practices but aren't organic certified. Got it. Thank you. Um, so Nancy asks, will the nitrogen content be lost if the urine is added daily to a five gallon pail? I think if it's just an open pail, probably you'll be losing a good amount of um, the nitrogen. Um, so at least finding a way to keep a lid on that pail or, or have a, another system where it can be closed uh, most of the time would probably be probably be a good idea. Unless your pail is full of biochar. <laughs> um, so if anyone has any other questions, please enter those into the chat. And while we wait and see if there are any last questions, um, I wonder, if, Julia, do you have a link for uh, the event that you could put in the chat in case anyone wants to uh, join? Yeah. Um, and we're... Uh... Registration will launch in early September, so we're not quite there yet, but you can also we have recordings from our past four virtual summits that you can check out. Um, so you can learn, uh, hear a little more about um, voices from pea cyclers from around the world that way as well. Oh, that's great. And if we could, could we send out your Etsy link too, to your yeah. products? Yeah. I'm very curious to see them. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, I can send you that and also the uh, community science survey link to share with folks. Oh, and, uh, as Don and as Donald is asking for the link to the home oh, guide. Nice. Yeah. How about I can send you guys an email with all the links and then you can send it to, <laughs> to everybody. <laughs> Thank you. Yes. Um, all right. Looks like we covered everybody's questions. Oh, oh, here's another one from Nancy. Thank you, Nancy. Um, is storing the urine in a closed jar for a few months going to change the product or is it still good? Yeah, still good as long as it's sealed off from the air. And you'll have the added benefit that um, storing the urine will slowly over time sanitize it as well. Um, it does get significantly darker in color, which has no effect on its fertilizer value, but is just something that happens. <laughs> so be not alarmed if that happens. <laughs> It's not gone bad. It's just a uh, changed shade. <laughs> great. Thank you. Well, thank you so much, Julia, for sharing all this great information with us. And um, I look forward to getting all those links, all those out to everybody. 
And again, if any of you all are around this weekend and would like to try out an e-bike, we will be at North Chapel from nine to five. Um, ideally, you could reserve um, a slot for a bike, um, but you can also just come and check them out if you'd like. We'll be there. Um, let's see. And yeah, I think we got all these questions. Um, and yes, uh, I will be sending a recording as well, and we'll put that on YouTube also. All right. Thank you so much, everybody. Thank you, Julia. Thank you, Julia. Thanks for having me, and thank you for all your questions. <laughs> all right. Good night, everybody. Bye.